Welcome to the world today. I am Amarachi Obani. We begin today's program with news from Gaza. The situation there has grown more intense with the UN Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire between Israel and Palestinian militants in Gaza. The call comes as the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry heads to Cairo for talks on the crisis amid a mountain threat, a mountain death toll. More than 500 Palestinians, most of whom where civilians have been killed since the Israeli offensive began 13 days ago. Israel has also lost two civilians and 18 soldiers during rocket attacks. Now, with each day, the conflict worsens, as yesterday has clearly been the deadliest since the start of the Israeli offensive. Three days since it announced the ground offensive, Israel has kept true to its word. The growing number of casualties have been more on the part of the Palestinians, with only a quarter or so of the more than 400 people who have been killed since the offensive began on the part of Israel. Gaza's hospitals are overwhelmed with the dead and wounded coming in consistently. A health ministry official says medical supplies are running out and there is shortage of medicine, particularly those needed to treat the wounded and perform emergency operations. And health teams have announced a red alert across all hospitals in the Gaza Strip, while officials have been urged to take responsibility. On Sunday alone, at least 50 Palestinians were killed in Israeli shelling on a Gaza neighborhood. With bodies strewn everywhere, thousands fled to a hospital for shelter, along with the wounded, which have numbered above 2,000 since Israel's offensive. Even worse is that ambulances cannot always reach victims because certain areas have been declared closed military zones. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has urged the UN Security Council to hold a session on Gaza and on Sunday, he declared three days of mourning after accusing Israel of carrying out a massacre in Shajaya neighborhood. He urged the international community to protect Palestinians. More than 60 Palestinians and 13 Israeli soldiers were killed as Israeli rocket fire hits Shajaya. And Sunday has been described as the bloodiest day since the start of the 13-day offensive. While Hamas has put no faith in Egypt's intervention in the crisis, it's developed a listening ear to Qatar. The militants have demanded that any agreement must include lifting a blockade imposed by Israel and Egypt on the Gaza Strip and a return to an understanding that ended a previous round of fighting in 2012. The UN Security Council was scheduled to hold a meeting on Sunday night after the UN Relief and Works Agency revealed that 81,000 displaced people have taken refuge in 61 unwarranted shelters in Gaza. In faraway South America, the Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, has condemned the Israeli airstrikes as a policy of genocide that could not be justified as like-for-like -like warfare. He explains that Palestine does not have an armed forces, so it's not a fair war. In the rest of the world, there have been protests in favor of Gaza. And as thousands of Palestinians flee their homes for safety, the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has promised to press on with Israeli campaign in the Hamas-controlled Gaza with the goal of restoring quiet while significantly damaging Hamas and other militant groups' infrastructure in Gaza. Well, some analysts like uh, Mr. Tommy Vincent of the Pan-Atlantic University believes that Israel and Palestine uh, and Hamas are fighting an unending war in the Middle East. It's a war that he says had been predicted by the Holy Bible many centuries ago. What happened with what really happened was that um, it, it, it was a politics of, um, um, let's put it like, extension of territorial powers. You know, um, France, um, Britain, and some other powers, as it were, were interested in that Palestine area. Now, um, 
also it's, it's not rule out um, U.S. as well, because in that sense, U.S. also was trying to, you know, you know, f you know all of them are trying to escape the moral, moral feeling that they had with the issue of how the uh, were treated in Europe and things like that. Then, particularly for for U.S., they didn't want more or less, you know, too much migration of these people into that place. So, like, let's give them a place there. Now, really, the British Prime Ministers at that time, I'm trying to remember his name, had promised the Palestinians, I'm going to give you this place. Mm -hmm. Just support me against, you know, these other incursions and things like that. You know, but just that when the pressure became too much, and also the fact that they needed, they felt that Israelites were more of a possible ally than the Palestinians. They just naturally, you know, give to them. And that really, that was 1950s, 19, um, the 1940s. That literally was a major, major blow to the psyche of the Palestinians who thought the West were a bit of their friends and things like that. Well, pro-Russian rebels have allowed Dutch investigators to examine bodies from the crashed Malaysia Airlines plane at a railway station in eastern Ukraine. Three Dutch experts said the train might leave the town of Torres later. All 298 people on board the flight uh, when it crashed died over the rebel-held area in, on July 17th. The U.S. and other nations say there's growing evidence of Russian complicity in the crash. But in the meantime, there have been heavy fighting in the main rebel-held city of Donetsk. It's been four days since the tragedy, and it's still a mix of sympathy and anger. For the Australian Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, he is particularly upset because of the activity at the scene of the M17 plane crash, which remains under the control of pro-Russian rebels in Ukraine. There's no doubt that at the moment the site is under the control of the Russian-backed rebels and given the uh, almost certain culpability of the Russian-backed rebels in the downing of the aircraft, having those people in control of the site is a little like leaving criminals in control of a crime scene. Meanwhile, Muslims in Malaysia prayed for the victims on board Malaysia Airlines flight MH17. Hassan Said, Taylor's University Vice Chancellor, attended special prayers for the 19 year old architecture student Mohammed Afif, who was from his school and was killed in the crash. We, we generally feel that sad, and uh, we hope to see him to graduate in another three years' time. He's just finished his foundation and he got another three years to finish his degree. He's a good student and uh, we, we, we feel that uh, you know, uh, we, 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 we lost a student that we, we think will become a good architect in the future. Afif's course mates Nadine Shahira said she would miss her friend. We feel Alhamdulillah with the people coming here with the closeness we can, you can really see that Shazana how Shazana is, like, people really love her. She's a very carefree person, responsible. She's a very caring person. She really took, uh, took care of all of us when we have been problem in school. So to Shazana, we're really going to miss you, Shazana. Hope you are. Look, you look after by God. This attack is still deemed the deadliest attack on a commercial airliner as it scattered bodies over miles of the rebel-held territory near the border with Russia. The blame game is still being played and Ukraine's prime minister says he's certain of Russian involvement rather than pro-Russian rebels fighting the Ukraine government. More than half of the dead passengers, 189 people, were Dutch. 29 were Malaysian, 27 Australian, 12 Indonesian, 10 British, 4 German, 4 Belgian, 3 Filipino, 1 America, 1 Canadian, and 1 New Zealander. Several were unidentified, and some may have had dual citizenship. The 15 crew were Malaysian. So did the, internet the shooting down of the airliner on Thursday, July the 17th, has sharply deepened the Ukrainian crisis, in which separatists in the Russian-speaking East have been fighting government forces since protesters in Kiev forced out a pro-Moscow president and Russia an ex-Crimea in March. Well, the VOA's Al Pesson joins me now live via Skype from the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. 
Al, thanks for joining us on The World today. Uh, we understand that the Dutch investigators are already at the site of the crash. How easy will it be for them to navigate the area and conduct a full investigation? Well, they're at the mercy of the separatists uh, at gunmen. But at least as far as the report we got this afternoon, they were being allowed to visit uh, several of the locations where parts of the plane came down and also to have a look inside the railroad cars that hold the bodies of the victims. So uh, the access was quite limited for some European monitors who were out there on Friday and Saturday, but yesterday it was better and today, uh, as I said, the, uh, the specialists that have finally arrived, the forensic investigators, were given uh, apparently reasonably good access. Uh, we understand the United States has complained, as well as uh, the Dutch government has complained, that um, the rebels have tampered with some evidence at the crash site. Of course, there's a lot of information floating around there at the site, but no one to coordinate that. Yes, it's really, uh, it's really kind of a mess, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, in fact, today, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine accused the Russian Secret Services of sending personnel into the area in the last few days specifically to tamper with evidence. And the speculation is that they were particularly looking for any fragments of uh, whatever missile shot down this aircraft so that those could be taken away. But that's only speculation. Uh, the Prime Minister also expressed concern about the fact that the flight recorders, known as the black boxes from the aircraft, are apparently in the hands of separatists, and the suggestion was that those are also being tampered with. I'm not a technical expert, so I don't know if that's possible or if it happened, whether it would be detectable. Uh, and, of course, we don't know whether or when uh, international investigators will ever get those black boxes or any other evidence or more extensive access to the site. All we know is that there was agreement to move the bodies in the refrigerated rail cars from the rebel-controlled area to a government-controlled area of eastern Ukraine about 300 kilometers away. That movement should be going on right now if they've kept to the schedule. And from there, from that town of Kharkiv, they're to be sent to Amsterdam for processing analysis and identification. And does it look like any side really is taking responsibility for this? Because while well, it's almost established that that plane was hit by a missile, but the question is who did it, right? Yes, you know, the Western intelligence agencies say that they detected the firing of a missile from an area inside the rebel-controlled zone. Ukraine says it has never fired that type of missile, although it does have some missiles like that. There was a report that three uh, trucks carrying such missiles and launchers uh, were sent back into Russia shortly after the shootdown, and that one of those trucks uh, had a missing missile, a holder for a missile where the missile was missing. So, there, And then there's the audio recording that the Ukrainian government has published that they say uh, is a telephone call or a radio call between separatist fighters and Russian operatives and the separatists had gone out to the crash site and were reporting back apparently in very surprised voices that this was not a military plane but it seemed to be a civilian plane with civilian casualties which suggests that the rebels thought they had shot down a Ukrainian military transport which was what they had posted online briefly after the incident bragging that they'd shot down an airplane then they took it down when they realized that maybe they got the wrong airplane. So all fingers right now point to Russia, directly or indirectly behind the rebels and the firepower, firepower with which, which was used in bringing down the airplane. But what happens, any idea what happens if it is established that either Russia or the Ukrainian army shot down the plane? You know, that's an excellent question. I know that European leaders today were talking about further sanctions on Russia, but that seemed to be directly related to the question of cooperation in the investigation. So we have had this first step of cooperation. Well, maybe I shouldn't say it's the first step, but this major step of cooperation uh, in apparently allowing the train carrying the bodies to get out of that area. 
but still uh, what the Europeans are demanding is full access to the area by qualified investigators. Now, some will argue that it's too late and that uh, the evidence have, has been tampered with, but still they want the access. So that's question number one, will they get the access?